One thing that is true about our culture is we love to judge. Uh, we just love being Mr. Judgy McJudgerson. And I, I've noticed that even it's even got into like the TV shows that we watch. If you think about it, whether it's The Voice, right? We want to see not, not necessarily the people sing, but we want to see Simon Cowell or whoever it is judge him afterwards. Hell's Kitchen. You probably shouldn't talk like that, but we sure like to watch. Cupcake Wars. We judge people on how good they can make cupcakes, for goodness sakes. And my wife is even watching one now, some, some British pottery throwdown where they're, they're judging. Yeah, I'm looking at you. They're judging them afterwards. So we love this idea of judging folks. But then again, when it's flipped around the other way, we say, hey, don't, don't judge me. I remember getting at my, my son as he was walking through the living room about sleeping half the day, and I'm going, hey, man, what are you doing? Hey, don't judge me. Well, nah, that's dad. I'm going to judge you. We think it's okay for them, but don't point that at me. And let, let's be honest, Christians have been accused of being incredibly judgmental people. Is that true? Is it appropriate if it is? Well, today as we get into the text, we're, we're, we're going to uh, get some helpful information here for, from Paul as he addresses this, this topic. But one thing to remember, as we open to 1 Corinthians 5, um, this is a real letter written to real people in real time. I think one of the things that we get confused at times is between Scripture written to us and for us. Scripture isn't written to us. This was written to a literal church that was in Corinth in the south of, of Greece almost 2,000 years ago. But it's written for us. In other words, we can sit back and, and watch what's happening and listen to how Paul addresses this guided by the Holy Spirit. And so we'll get into that today in 1 Corinthians 5. And just, just to, to be open about this, I've, I've had, I was talking with a buddy earlier, and I'm like, hey, look at what I get to preach on this weekend is 1 Corinthians 5. And the comment was, is that actually in the Bible? Yes, it is. Now, I'm not going to let this get PG-13 today, so don't, don't worry about that. Because honestly, we may not deal with this situation, but it gives, it gives us guidance for how the church should use judgment, how the church should deal with struggles. And if we see this text right, if we'll see this right, we'll have a proper understanding of what judgment plays in the church. And it'll raise our understanding of the role of the church in our lives. So let, let, let's, let's back up here for one second. Remember, so Paul's written this church that's struggling. Really, they're struggling a lot with unity. It's a church plant gone bad, and, and they're uh, um, really turning against Paul at this point. And so he addresses some of that unity and addresses some of the issues. And then when you get to chapter 4, all of chapter 4 is basically Paul saying, hey, look, I'm coming that way, and I'm bringing a switch. And if you don't know what a switch is, ask one of the older folks in the room and they'll, I know what one is from experience. Paul's saying, I'm coming. And this might not go very easy for you when I get there. Because the church is really in, in, in a bad spot. So with all that in mind, now we're going to step into this situation. 1 Corinthians 5, let's start in verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind of sexual immorality that's not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you're arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Hey, just stop there. Uh, so let, let's just be honest about it. Hey, that's gross. You know, th this, this, is, this is a problem. And Paul says, man, even the Gentiles say that's nasty. Even the Gentiles are saying that, that's a problem. And if you go, gosh, that, that's actually in Scripture. That's a little awkward. 
Try preaching it. It just is. Uh, there is a, a, a guy in this church here in Corinth who's having an affair with his stepmother. But notice the woman's not mentioned in the text. It's likely she wasn't a Christian. Honestly, it's likely he wasn't either, but he's still there. Now, we don't need to elaborate on why that's wrong. We all get that, right? We, we, we get that that's wrong. Now, Paul's concern here, though, is that the church isn't doing anything about the problem. His concern is that they're ignoring it. And I, and I, I get it because we've all been there. It's like, hey, man, I got my, I'm not judging anybody. I got my own problems. Watch out for number one. Try not to step in number two. I got my own things. I'm, I, I don't want to judge. Paul looks and he goes, no, that, that's arrogance is what that is. And honestly, we could list a whole list of other things to describe what that would be. Some scholars think that this, the guy that's in the affair may have been wealthy. And you could see that. Well, we'd, we really don't want to tick him off because he's got a big tithe check. You know, we're going to put a brick with his name on it in the new building. Maybe. Maybe they're snickering about it. Maybe they're just ignoring it. But either way, it's bad enough to where the news about this gets all the way to Paul. All the way to Paul. He recoils in horror that this would happen in a church. And he says, you should be heartbroken. You should be heartbroken about what's happening here. Now, here's the reality, is that, that we may not deal with this same struggle, at least I hope not. We may not deal with this same thing, but we do deal with sin in the church, don't we? We do deal with problems that come up in the church. Now, the church is designed to be uh, an embassy of heaven, a, a little piece of heaven that's here and now. So the work of the church, may, make sure you follow me on this. The work of the church isn't here. So when we talk about our volunteering, that doesn't happen on Sundays. Yes, there are volunteer roles that have to be filled. But the work of the church is out there. The work of the church is Monday through Saturday and then start again Sunday after lunch. That's where the work of the church is. Here is supposed to be the place where we get back together and we get to sing songs together to our great God and be reminded that no one loves us like Jesus does. And that because of him we have a new family and because of him we have a hope and because of him we don't have shame and because of him we have purpose. So when the world gets dragged in, it becomes something that's very unnatural. And I'll be honest, I've had about all that I can stand of hearing stories of about a pastor who's had to step out because of a sin struggle or because of a, 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 an improper eldership around him so he's in an abusing folks or, or uh, where sin has come into the church and now there's been a division in the church and now there's been a split in the church uh, because folks just can't get along. I've had about all that I can hear about that because remember, it's not just the fact that that happens, but that the good name of Jesus gets drugged through the mud every time it happens. It makes the news every time it happens. And I'm here to tell you that that is a sin on a catastrophic level. So we have to be serious about this. Get this church. How we live matters. How we go about the business of church matters. We can never have an effective witness in the world if we're fighting here and we're struggling here. How we live matters. And I, honestly, there is a flavor of Christianity that tends to ignore, actually, the, maybe we'll say several, uh, so that they tend to ignore the fact that we're called to holy lives. It, it, it may come through using grace as an excuse. I have grace, so I don't have to take this as serious. 
Let me t tell you this, and I can just cut through that pretty quick. If you get grace, we take this serious. If you get the gift that's been given to us, we take this sort of thing seriously. But it also comes through, through that type that, of, of Christianity that, that, that starts by saying, hey, God's just trying to give you a breakthrough today. In, in other words, we want to focus on the end-time benefit getting dragged into our present reality. Hey, God's just dying to give you, give you a breakthrough today. I don't know what you're struggling with, but God's going to make it all better today. I'm going to tell you, that does not match the narrative of Scripture. The narrative of Scripture oftentimes is, yeah, it's bad and it may get worse, but let me tell you something. Hang in there because Jesus wins. Jesus wins. And because He wins, we can handle today. Because He wins, we come together as a people. We have hope. We have purpose. We have to be the type of people, the type of church, Thrive Church. Make sure we hear this. We have to be the type of people that do the right thing and speak grace and truth. To be willing to do that. Because Jesus is already in the business of making everything new. And how we go about ourselves as a church, it matters. Look at what Paul continues to say. Look at verse 3. Even though... I'm absent in the body. I'm present in spirit. As one who's present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who's been doing such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I'm with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting isn't good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you can have a new unleavened batch. As indeed you are, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, I get that there's a lot of that that may not sound all that familiar when we start talking about leaven. Uh, that's real similar to yeast, by the way. Those of you who would make, you know, during quarantine, all of a sudden we all thought we were bakers and all kinds of stuff there. So, Paul says this. Paul says, I may not be with you, but I'm not exactly absent. Make sure you know that I'm standing with you. That, that I'm already with you on this. Because think about it, just from a practical standpoint, the Holy Spirit that filled Paul fills you. And the same Holy Spirit that fills you fills me. So the church is united together. Each week when we receive communion, what are we being reminded of? That we're united together under the blood and body of Jesus Christ. He says, I might not be there, but I'm, I'm still there with you. And I think even more to this point, probably the most misused uh, verse in Scripture is, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there with you. Well, Matthew chapter 18, we'll get to that here in just a moment. But what that text is about is when there's a struggle in the church, when there's a problem, Jesus gives, he lines out the, the way that we address that problem. And he says, well, hey, we're, we're two or three show up for this purpose. Know that I'm standing right with you. Know that I'm with you through this sort of thing. In these cases, judgment is absolutely appropriate. Paul says, we don't ignore sin in the church. Think about it as, as folks who have had our own Sin, dealt with by Jesus, we humbly and carefully approach these scenarios. But what we can't do is ignore them. And there, there's typically a, there's a progression that sin has. And if, if you wanted a, a, an easy example, go back and study the life of David. When, when you watch it, it says in, in the spring, when kings go off to war, David was taking a nap on the roof of the palace. 
Pretty soon, this great, ba- this great warrior, the one who fought Goliath, finds himself not only guilty of a terrible affair, maybe even worse, but also the, the murder of one of his most trusted advisors. Sin has a progression, and it usually starts off like this, minimization. What's well, not that big a deal? You know, it's really not. Hey, nobody got hurt. And then it moves from minimization to normalization. Well, everybody's doing it. And then it'll move from normalization to celebration. That's the enlightened thing to do. It's the best thing. Look at how far we've come. And let me illustrate this on a, on a high level. Minimalization, normalization, and celebration. Prior to 1973, abortion was, was reserved for extreme cases in the United States. It was something that didn't happen uh, frequently. Well, Roe v. Wade normalized it. No, Roe v. Wade in 1973 made that something that uh, it, it changed the course of where America was going in this, on this topic. It was minimized. But then it got normalized. In, 19, in the 90s, there was a, 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 a Princeton professor, a guy from Australia, a guy by the name of Peter Singer. He's an ethicist who he wanted to continue to push us towards normalizing this sort of thing and, and making excuses for why it should be acceptable. I'm going to read you just a couple of his quotes on why post-birth abortion and his post-birth abortion in his estimation, should be normalized. Human babies, this is a quote, human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they uh, exist over time. They're not persons, but animals are self-aware. And therefore, the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. This is a professor at Princeton Later, he would say, it doesn't seem wise to add to the burden on limited resources by increasing the number of severely disabled children. Then he wrote, a period of 28 days after birth might be allowed before an infant is accepted as having the same rights as others. So we've moved from minimization to an attempt to normalize now, in the 90s, this was still considered radically left. I mean, it still was considered left. But then it moves, what, to celebration. Kari Stephenson, a geneticist and neurologist in Iceland, announced this. I think it, it was last year. My understanding is that we have basically eradicated almost Down syndrome from our society that there is hardly ever a child with Down syndrome in Iceland anymore. What he's referring to, his version of eradicating Down syndrome was through abortion. God forgive us. And you say, well, that's there, that's not here. A couple years ago, two years ago in Virginia, they attempted to push through a a legislation that would have opened the door to this same sort of thing. And in certain circles, it was lauded. That this is enlightened. This is right. This is the way to go. And you look at that and you see how we went from minimalization to normalize it. And then finally to celebrate it. And that may be a, a, a big overview, but it happens on smaller levels as well, doesn't it? It happens in our lives. Think back, there'll be times in your life when you thought, man, I'd never cross that line. But once we've crossed that line, then we move it, don't we? Uh, hey, not hurting anybody else. And then we move from that to, hey, this, this is really right. Finally, we end up just joking about it. And Paul encourages the church to love folks enough to stand up and to say something. Judgment in the church is not only helpful, honestly, it's required. But notice that in this judgment, the goal is always restoration. 
The goal is always that we would help someone come back to a, to a place of communion with the church, to, a, to a, a place where that isn't haunting their lives. Repentance and restoration is the goal. One of the clear patterns of the New Testament is you see this. Paul talks about it. Jesus talks about it. Uh, I'm, this isn't going to be on the screen, but I want you just to hear Jesus' words here. This comes from Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. By the way, that's an Old Testament rule. That, that whenever there was a controversy, you always brought two or three others, witnesses, just so that things would be done properly. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. And if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be a, like a Gentile or a tax collector to you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, this, this judgment, Jesus says, yes, heaven agrees with that. And when someone is restored, heaven agrees with that. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, now this, any matter to pray for isn't if you and I get together and pray later, later that God would provide a new convertible. And I joke, but I've had someone ask me to pray with that. Because if we're two or, you know, to agree on something in prayer, God will provide it. No, he's talking about when we have to have those hard conversations. If two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Let's talk about what this doesn't mean. What this doesn't mean that as a church, we have the right to just go around and start picking apart people's lives. You know, like we, we hand out uh, flags to, here's your sin, and here's your sin, and here's your sin. And we all stand back and snicker. That's not what that means. Because the reality is this, is that every one of us is a sinner. And every one of us needs grace, not just when we first came, but we need grace today. And here's the reality, we're going to need grace again tomorrow. So we approach this carefully and prayerfully and cautiously. Because what this does mean is that as a church, we don't get the right to sweep stuff under the rug and act like it's not there. When that happens, Satan wins because the church starts to fracture. And a church that's fractured is a church that won't glorify God and it'll never engage its mission on what it's supposed to do. We're not going to act like the elephant's not in the room. What it does mean is that we have to love one another enough to speak up, to go and to look someone in the eyes and say, I love you, man, but this is a problem. And we go and we address these things individually. If that doesn't happen, we go and grab two or three other mature Christians. And let, hey, let, let's sit down and have this conversation. If that doesn't help, you go to the church leadership. And by the way, if it is a church leader, say if it were me, you, you go to the elders. And if it's, a, if it's a senior church leader, then it's one of those that by, by Scripture we have to take to the whole church. It's the way that it works. Again, again, the goal of this is always restoration between that person and God and between that person and the church. The goal is never to isolate and to throw someone out forever. The goal is always, even if it means that we can't be together for a bit, the goal is always restoration. I'm going to tell you, I've been a part of two of two of these on a pretty high level, it, times where the whole church had to be involved. One went really, really well. And there was a restoration uh, plan put in place for this individual. And man, he followed it to a T. And he, he was a person who was on staff at a church where I worked. And he followed it to the T. And it was actually, it was really healing and it brought healing in his life. And I thought it was God glorifying for the, for the church 
And we all learned and we all worshiped through it because honestly, it's painful to do that. But it's another thing to stand alongside a brother, receive communion together, sing together, and know that this has to happen. At the end, it was God glorifying. The other one went terribly bad, and it tanked immediately. And as far as I know, he's not in church anywhere. Either way, the church has to follow the biblical pattern here. That's the way that this happens. Both Jesus and Paul say, if they refuse to repent, you treat them as someone who needs to be evangelized. He, he says, treat them like a sinner or a tax collector. Well, the, the funny thing about that is, who did Jesus always hang out with? Sinners and tax collectors, because he was there with an agenda, because they needed to come to Christ. They needed to come to him. They needed to repent. But when it came time for intimate fellowship with the Lord, there was going to be a separation. Uh, one of the, the, the greatest theologians that America has ever produced was a, was a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Um, and he actually, he got fired from the church where he was preaching because he would withhold communion. When someone, would, you know, if you stumble and drunk on Sunday morning and, and he would say, hold on. This doesn't match, and I love you enough to stand up to you. We're going to deal with this, and then you'll be restored to communion. He was following the biblical pattern. And they didn't like it. Now, there are cases. There are cases where we would say, yeah, you wouldn't be welcome here for a while under any circumstance. Uh, cases of abuse. Where, where there was abuse in the, in the home, we would, first of all, we'd call the cops. And then there would be a separation. Or if, if a, a man left his wife and kids, and while they're coming to church, he shows up with his girlfriend. That's not going to fly. Why? Because we have to protect and love one another. Paul gives this picture of leaven. Uh, back in the day, you couldn't go and buy little packets of yeast. You know, the, add the water and the sugar and throw it in there. It, it didn't work that way. So what they would have to do is take a, a piece of the old dough and stick it in the new one. Every time you made bread, that's how you, you did that. And the, the leaven with the yeast would come through that and it would, that's how they'd get leavened bread. The, the problem is, is that could get infected. And when that got infected, it would transfer to the new bread. And then the new bread would get infected and it would transfer to the next. And you see how this happens is the problem gets worse and worse and worse. So they had a rule that every year, just before Passover, when Passover happened, you threw all the bread out. They had to start over. There had to be something new. There had to be something that was a break from the old. And what's Paul say? Our Passover happened in Jesus. There has to be a break from the old. What, what was coming in from that old way of life isn't welcome anymore. There has to be something new. The stuff that was all right in our old lives isn't welcome anymore. That doesn't belong in the church. And so here Paul is going to offer a little clarity as we go forward. Look at verse 9. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexual immoral people. Now, what's that tell you? First of all, this isn't the first letter he's written. He's been in dialogue with them. Uh, I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Don't even eat. Now, think about here. The, their communion, the church had a meal on Sundays. He says, we, we're not going to eat. We're not going to do that there. For what business is it of mine to judge the outsiders? Don't you judge those who are on the inside? God judges outsiders. Remove the evil person from among you. 
No, notice Paul widens it. It's not just about sexual immorality. He, he widens this and he's saying our task isn't to judge the world. We don't look at the world and go, hey, they're not acting like Christians. They're, they're not. So why would we expect them to respond as Christians? And can we be honest for a second? The church has been oftentimes guilty of griping about the world not acting like Christians while we're not cleaning up our own houses. While we're not taking care of what's happening here. It's not our position to judge the world. That's up to God. It's our position to bring the world to Christ. It's specifically our position to be concerned with the holiness of the church, with us loving one another. You see, Paul isn't concerned that the church would speak truth to the culture. Paul here is concerned that the church would hold itself accountable to the truth. Make sure we get that is that we would be people first and foremost about Scripture, that we would be people who are about truth. Grace, grace doesn't give the church an excuse to not keep our house in order. We need to care as much about holiness in here as we do about the lack of it out there. It's worth saying, as long as we stay on the fringes of the church, we come, oh, we sing, and we leave. As long as we stay on the fringes, we'll never ever be a part of that community that God's created to love one another, to help one another, to come alongside one another, and even to challenge one another if need to be. Only by immersing ourselves in the church and being part of the church can we do that. Thrive. We have the opportunity to do something special. You realize we, we have a piece of property in the center of the largest neighborhood in Indiana. And they're putting up houses all around us. They're at current count, there's about 3,000 we have an opportunity to plant and to do something that's rare. I mean really rare. We better be sure that we're about holiness here as we start to engage out there. I'm going to pray. And the prayer is going to be that this, that we would be people who take it, take it first and foremost here before we ever engage the world out there. That we love one another enough to, to stand up and to challenge and to call to repentance and to engage folks so that uh, we don't just drift off or that we don't allow a sin to tear what God is putting together apart. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, even now as we, we come to communion, we're reminded that this is something that you bought and paid for. Your life, your blood, your goodness, our adoption. Lord, would you remind us of that again? Lord, our prayer is that Thrive would be this church that, that takes this kind of thing serious. And even when we come to tough passages like today, that we would get it. And that we would love one another enough to stand up. Enough to, to call each other to holiness. Lord, would you be exalted and would you be present in every second of it. In Jesus' name, amen.